Hi, Brian from Sue Generis Brewing here, and welcome to part two of my series on managing a beer solera. In video one, I discussed the factors you need to consider to start a new solera, and in this video, we're going to look at what you need to do when it's time to withdraw beer from that solera and brew the refill. In the third video, I will discuss how to finish the beer that's been pulled from your solera. But one important note, although I'm presenting the refilling process and the finishing process as separate videos, in reality, these occur in parallel. And so you need to be prepared to perform both at the same time, every time your beer reaches maturation. Preparing for withdrawing and refilling your solera starts about one month prior to your planned withdrawal date. At this time, you need to pull a sample of your Solera and perform a detailed tasting. These tasting notes are used to tweak the recipe for the beer that you're going to brew to refill your Solera. We need to tweak the recipe each time because this is what allows us to push the flavor and the character of the beer towards the character we've envisioned for our Solera. Because we only get one chance per filling cycle to adjust that flavor profile, we need to be very careful in that tasting to make sure that we have a clear understanding of our beer's characteristics. We then use those tasting notes to inform that redesign of our recipe. For this tasting, I fill a CO2 purged beer bottle using a sanitized steel turkey baster and then force carbonate that sample. I give it a day or two to settle and then I work through a detailed tasting worksheet that captures most of the flavors and off flavors that I expect from my Solera. I found that using this worksheet is absolutely critical because otherwise I forget to look for specific flavors or to look for some of the more subtle flavors that might be present. I also do this tasting at two different temperatures, right out of the fridge, and then once the beer warms to more of a cellar temperature. The reason for that is different flavors and aromas become more apparent at one temperature versus another, so that's just another way that I can ensure that I don't miss anything important. I've included a link to this tasting sheet in the video description if you'd like to use it yourself. Once this tasting is complete, it's time to design the recipe for the refill. First, we need to determine the volume needed. That's gonna be equal to the volume expect to withdraw, plus any angel share that might've been lost during aging, plus the volume you removed for your tasting, plus a little bit extra as a fudge factor to count for any trube or other stuff that may cause losses from the primary fermenter to the Solera. Once you've got your volume dialed in, you can design your recipe. The goal of this recipe design is to push the character of the beer towards the desired flavor and aroma profile while retaining your overall characteristics and desired vision of the beer. For a clean beer, this is pretty straightforward. Hopping rates can be adjusted to control bitterness, the balance between different character malts can be adjusted, and then mash temperature and malt selection can be adjusted to modify the beer's body. Adjusting sour beers is much more challenging because you're trying to control the activity of Saccharomyces, Brettanomyces, Lactobacillus, and Pediococcus, and that's in addition to controlling those flavors that are derived from the ingredients. So this is not as straightforward as adjusting flavors in a clean beer, and because of that, most of this video is focusing on controlling flavor in a sour beer Solera. The first thing we want to adjust is the acidity of the sour beer. And there are two main approaches that we can use to achieve this. The first is adjusting the beer's bitterness as alpha acids from hops can inhibit the ability of lactobacillus to acidify beer. Hops are a powerful way of controlling acidity because they attack a core biochemical process in these bacteria. Bacterial metabolism produces a lot of free protons, which are what create acidity. To control their intracellular pH, bacteria export these protons out of the cell, and this is what acidifies the beer. This doesn't just control intracellular pH, it also creates an electrical chemical gradient that the bacteria use to pump certain nutrients into the cell. Hops act as an ionophore, meaning they grab those protons and drive them back into the bacteria. This acidifies the bacterial cytosol, which impairs their metabolism, but it also weakens that proton gradient, which can cause the cell to starve. That said, using increasing hop levels is the last approach you should use, because bacteria do become resistant to hops over time, 
meaning that you'll need to use ever increasing levels of hops to control acidity. Eventually that will hit a point where the bitterness clashes with the sourness and at that point the beer is ruined and unfortunately there isn't a way to come back from that. I mentioned in the last video that I recently had to kill my Flanders Red Solera and this is exactly the issue I ran into. The beer just had to get more and more bitter to keep the acidity in check and eventually it was just unbearable. The bitterness required was over 30 IBUs which is a pretty intense bitterness for a sour beer and it was still a very acidic beer and it just it was unpleasant. You couldn't even blend it into stuff so I ended up dumping that Solera. And let me tell you that was a pretty hard way to learn about that limitation of using hops to control sourness. So is there a better approach? Well, the good news is there is. The answer is we control what we feed to the bacteria. When we mash, we ma convert starches into a mixture of simple sugars that get eaten by things like yeast and larger dextrans that are the primary food used by souring bacteria. So we can reduce acidity by making more simple sugars through using a lower mash temperature. Conversely, if we want more acidity, we can mash at a higher temperature to create more unfermentable sugars, leaving behind uh, more material for the lactobacillus to ferment and create acidity. We can further control the food available to souring bacteria via the yeast that we select to pre-ferment the wort. A weekly attenuative strain will leave a lot of sugars and dextrans behind, providing the bacteria with a fine banquet of delectable carbohydrates that they can use to acidify the beer. A more attenuative wort, such as any of the diastatic yeasts out there, will consume most of the sugars and some of the dextrans, leaving much less behind for the bacteria. In other words, we have a number of options for controlling acidity. To reduce acidity, we can use a highly attenuative yeast, we can mash low to make a fermentable wort, or we can increase our IBUs. If we want a more acidic beer, we can use a less attenuative yeast, we can mash at a higher temperature to create a more dextrinous wort, and we can decrease our IBU levels. Now sometimes you just can't get the acidity you want, and at this point we need to use the nuclear option in order to push this balance in the direction we want to go. And the answer here is we put our finger on the scale by pre-acidifying the beer. What I mean by that is you kettle sour the beer in the primary fermenter, just like you would for a quick sour beer. That can then be fermented with a conventional yeast, giving you a highly sour fermented beer that you can now add into your Solera in order to immediately push that sourness down. Next up is controlling Britannomyces. Because Britannomyces grows well off of the corpses of dead yeasts and minute amounts of dextrans, it's really difficult to control their activity by controlling the fermentability of the wort. Instead, we need to control the amount of flavor and aroma precursors in the wort that the Britannomyces convert into those typical Britannomyces flavors. These precursors come in the form of ferulic acid, cumeric acid, and caffeic acid that are extracted from the cell walls of malt during mashing. These are flavorless compounds that are converted to flavor active phenols by Britannomyces and POF positive Saccharomyces. This conversion is a two-step process. The first step can be mediated either by Britannomyces or by POF positive Saccharomyces. And these convert these flavorless compounds through decarboxylation to form compounds that have clove, spicy, and smoky characters. Think of the flavors present in your typical Belgian ale or Saison. Those are these kinds of flavors. Britannomyces can process these further, producing additional spicy and peppery notes, as well as the earthy, leather, tobacco, and farmyard flavors characteristic of Britannomyces. There are multiple ways that we can control the activity of Britannomyces, Again, largely through controlling the amounts of these unflavored precursors in the warts. To reduce the Britannomyces character, we can use malts that lack a lot of these precursors, or at least have these precursors in a form that can't easily be extracted. So this would include minimally modified malts like Pilsner and Chit malt, completely unmodified malts like raw grains, or malts like wheat malt. 
if we want to bring up the amounts of phenols, we want to seek out malts that are going to have more of these precursors available. So this would include things like rye malt, highly modified forms of barley, which would include things like conventional two-row malts, as well as um, melanoidin-style malts, so things like Vienna, Munich, aromatic, melanoidin. These tend to have a lot of those phenolic precursors in them. Another thing we can do is add phenolics directly. The most common way that this can be done is through the addition of smoked malt. We can also enhance the release of these compounds from malt during the mashing process by performing a step mash with a ferulic acid rest. This rest is done at 45 degrees Celsius and it optimizes the activity of ferulic esterase which is the enzyme that releases those unflavored precursors from the malt. Performing one of these mashes is quite simple. You're going to mash in at 45 degrees Celsius, hold it for 15 to 20 minutes, and then you're going to increase the temperature to your desired sacrification temperature. There are a few other things we can do during fermentation to control the production of these phenolic compounds. To reduce them, we can pre-ferment our wort with a clean, so a PUF negative Saccharomyces strain. Whereas we can increase the phenolic compounds by pre-fermenting our wort with a phenolic off-flavor positive Saccharomyces strain. These will push that first step in the conversion of the unflavored compounds to flavored compounds, which will then accelerate the production of these flavors by Brettanomyces. So overall, we have a few tools we can use to control Brettanomyces. We can reduce Brettanomyces character by pre-fermenting with POF negative yeast. We can avoid a ferulic acid rest. We can select malts that are low in available precursors, whereas if we want more Brettanomyces character, we can pre-ferment with POF positive yeast, we can perform a ferulic acid rest, and we can select malts with plenty of those available precursors. The final thing we can regulate is the body of the beer. Now this is very challenging with sour beers because the Brettanomyces and Lactobacillus present in the culture, as well as any diastatic yeast, will convert dextrans into simple sugars that then get fermented, producing a thinner body. The reason they can do this is they express enzymes that have the ability to break down alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds, which are the bonds between the sugar molecules in dextrans. So one approach we can use to increase body is to use malts that have beta-glucans. Beta-glucans have a dextran-like structure they have a similar impact on mouthfeel, but they're made by sugars linked together by beta-1,3 and beta-1,4 bonds, which are less effectively metabolized by things like Brettanomyces and bacteria. This can leave some body behind that would otherwise be lost. Another option is to pre-ferment the beer with a glycerol-producing yeast. High glycerol yeasts are not common among brewing strains, but they are common among wine yeasts. These yeasts convert part of the sugars they consume into glycerol, and this is something they do to help manage osmotic stress in high alcohol environments. Even small amounts of glycerol can add significant body to a beer, making this a powerful tool that you can use to try and add body. But you do have to take a lot of care with this approach, because many wine strains are what we call killer yeasts, meaning that they secrete toxins that will kill other Saccharomyces strains in the Solera, which is obviously going to have some very negative impacts on the long-term stability of that Solera. So if you try to do this, make sure you only use killer-sensitive wine yeast. And I would also point out that some bacteria and even some yeast may consume that glycerol. So even though you may have a glycerol-producing yeast in there, it may not actually do much to add body. So just to summarize, we can reduce body by thinning out our wort by using things like sugar. We can use low beta-glucan grains like yeast and barley, uh, whereas we can use high beta-glucan yeast uh, to add more body. This would be things like rye or oats. Uh, we can use high glycerol producing yeast to try and add some body as well. But again, when it comes to sour beer, controlling body is fairly difficult. And even though you can try these approaches, they're probably not gonna have a huge impact on your beer. That was a lot to take in, so let's go through an example. Here's my score sheet for my latest withdrawal from the Everybody in the Pool Solera. Now, unfortunately for this video, this was actually one of the best pulls I've had from the Solera. So it really didn't need a lot of tweaking to that recipe. But it was slightly over acidified and the Brettanomyces character was a little bit weaker than I would have preferred.
So how do I go about fixing these? To avoid driving hop resistance in the Solera, I'm not adjusting the bitterness and I'm keeping it at the roughly 10 IBUs that this beer has been at for the past 11 years. Instead, I'm relying on the addition of some sugar to help thin out the body, as well as uh, a lower mash temperature to drive a highly attenuative wort. To help ensure the success of this mash, I have picked a high enzyme two row malt to really ensure that I have the enzymes needed to produce such a fermentable wort. Lastly, I'm using a relatively uh, attenuative yeast to further ensure reasonable attenuation and get rid of uh, a lot of those sugars that the bacteria would otherwise ferment. So that'll hopefully control the lactobacillus, but I also want to push up the Britannomyces character. So to do that, I again, I'm using a malt that should have a fair amount of frulic acid precursors available to it or in it. And I've added a ferulic acid rest, which should hopefully push some of that character a little bit further. Now, I had intended to ferment with a POF positive yeast, but unfortunately the culture was not ready on time, which is why I just went with a more attenuative, clean strain. Uh, but if I had my preferred option, I would have used a POF positive strain. So I brewed 23 liters of that beer that I pre-fermented for two and a half weeks. At that point, I took 20 liters of beer out of my Solera and refilled with my pre-fermented beer, being careful to avoid carrying over yeast or trub so that I don't get that buildup in the bottom of my Solera. I then recapped the Solera and left it to ferment for the next eight months. And actually at the time that I'm recording this video, I'm just about a month away from needing to brew that refill for the next round of the Solera. One aspect of managing a slurrer that can be difficult is calculating the conversion age and times between poles in the real world. Of course, some of you might be able to stick exactly to your plant schedule, but if we're being honest, most of us won't do that. Life gets in the way, things happen, and before you know it, you're three months behind schedule. Now you can calculate these ages manually, but to help with this, I've prepared a spreadsheet that does it all automatically and I've made this available both as a Google Sheet and as an Excel spreadsheet, the link to which can be found below. So let's quickly go through how this works. So on the first tab, there are some instructions that you can go through, and this includes a, a simple calculator where you can put in the volume of beer that you want to withdraw each withdrawal and the amount of time that you want between withdrawals to come up with what your convergent age is going to be. This is useful for planning, but it of course is just giving you a calculation for determining what to do up front. What we really want to do is calculate values from pole to pole to pole. So this can be found here under the Solera spreadsheet. You can see here I started using this for everybody in the pool back in December of 2020. Now before you can even start using this table, you need to enter in your desired effective age and this is what's going to be used to make the different calculations. And if you want to change this, you can simply change this value and you can see that it automatically recalculates the values um, for your upcoming polls. And I would point out that this data here is really all about your next poll, when it should take place, how many months it's going to be until you hit that desired age, and your current effective age. So to add a new entry, the first thing we need to do is copy the um, formulas to a new line, and now we're gonna change these values to match what we're doing in our current refill. So let's pretend for argument's sake that we are doing this on um, February 21st, 2024. So that was a couple weeks ago. Here's our effective age, roughly 16 months at the pre-fill time and point. Our pre-fill volume is 56 liters, a full keg. We're going to remove 22 liters, but let's just say this time around, actually, we're going to change this. We want a little bit more. We're going to remove 30 liters, and of course, we're going to refill it with 30 liters. And we've pre-fermented that beer for two weeks, so that beer is half a month old, so we enter that data there. And we now have our next set of calculations complete. So you can see it automatically calculated the um, post-fill volume based on the amount we took out and the amount we put in. And you can see over here that it has updated our 
um, calculations for the next fill. So it's going to be 9.9, so roughly 10 months until we get back to an average age of 18, which will be the 1st of January 2025. So hopefully that calculator makes sense. But there is one last thing we haven't talked about, and that is what you do with that beer you just pulled out of your Solera. Again, that's a pretty large topic, and that's the topic of the third video in this video series. So check out that video to see how all of this ends. Once again, thank you for watching. I hope you found it interesting and educational, and I hope to see you in the next video.